Can we be forgiven of sinning the same sin more than once? Next on Polygamy, what love is this? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, including plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age, but she ran away. That girl was me. I was lost. Then Jesus Christ found me. I found real freedom. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in Him. A focus of our ministry, a primary focus, is to debunk what Joseph Smith and other teachers or so-called prophets in Mormonism have taught, many who have claimed that their source or authority is derived from biblical concepts and direct from God. We use various sources to explain various viewpoints on the errors of Mormonism, <clears throat> and the majority of our quotes are taken from their own doctrine and from their own prophets or teachers. <clears throat> so if we're labeled anti-Mormon or anti-polygamy, then Mormonism is anti-Mormon. There are many people whose hearts are broken because of the false doctrines of Mormonism, and many are also involved in bringing this culture into the light of biblical truth as they reveal the darkness of Mormon doctrine. One of them is our guest today. He does an excellent job of research and communication comparing Mormonism with biblical truths. So we would like to introduce and welcome our guest, Aaron Shafawala. <laughs> it's Shafawala. Shafawala. I enjoy every minute of the mispronunciations. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty. I'm sorry. I, tr I practice too, and I still <laughs> didn't get it right. Um, Aaron, thanks for coming and sharing your thoughts with us. They're, they're profound. I think they're great. And I just wanted to share them with our viewers, especially with our polygamous viewers too, because they are steeped in Mormon doctrine as much and even more maybe than the LDS are. Mm -hmm. So um, on Facebook recently, um, what what got me to, to, to contact you for to do the show was that you posted some quotes from the book, Miracle of Forgiveness. Uh, and because of the contents of the book is so, like I say, relevant to polygamists as well, I asked you to share some of it with our viewers. And although it was written by an LDS apostle which, who became president of the church, it's still p applicable to Mormon polygamists. You know, mm -hmm. They don't really pay attention to Mormon prophets or apostles, but there's, um, their teachings are so close. The book Miracle of Forgiveness was written by Spencer W. Kimball. Please give some background of the book and how was it utilized in the Mormon setting and is it still being utilized the same way? Spencer Kimball did a lot of interviews with people who wanted to talk about sin problems that they had. Young people especially, or young couples that would come and confess sins. And Kimball thought he should compile a book motivating people to deal seriously with their sin and to strive for forgiveness. So he spends a good amount in the book treating sin as a very severe topic which in general is a great thing. Mm -hmm. But then he outlines prerequisites or steps one should complete in order to someday arrive at uh, absolution or forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, so the book has been used in the LDS culture and church. Uh, it's been for a time sold from the, dis the LDS distribution center. It's been, of course, sold in the bookstores um, like Deseret Book. And it's been a really popular book. Um, in fact, uh, bishops have used it um, a lot. They, they, I, I've heard plenty of stories of people going to their bishop, confessing especially a sexual sin and mm -hmm. being given uh, a copy of the miracle of forgiveness because there's a stack of them you know, behind, yeah. behind the desk. And so it's, it's been a part of the LDS counseling. It's been a part of, a, part of bishop Part Layman of their experience. process yeah. of repentance was to read the book and, and follow mm -hmm. the directions. Do they still use it for that? Go to source. So uh, they have stopped printing it, uh, the paper version of the book. They still digitally sell it as an ebook, oh. uh, but they've um, they 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 still quote it in the Gospel Principles, which is a manual that they use, and it's had a profound impact on their culture. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, it, it's well, I, I would love to make this point. They have sold uh, millions of copies of this. Let me see, see here. There's. Uh, foreign publication rights were given to the church, and by 1974, arrangements had been made for translation 
for the book into 16 languages. Oh, no. <laughs> and by 1998, the total in all languages roughly was as, roughly estimated at 1.6 million copies. Wow. So there, uh, this isn't an oops. This isn't, uh, yeah. th this was distributed widely stuff. on purpose. And it was, if you read a president's, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they have a, a series of manuals that they use. They mm -hmm. have one devoted to the, the various LDS prophets, and they have one for Spencer Kimball with a whole chapter with nothing but quotes oh. from the miracle of forgiveness. Oh my, so. my goodness. And I have heard feedback, like you said, from people who have uh, talked about that the bishops will give out this as part of their repentance process. And, and they've hated, they, they, they read it and just hated it and, and walked away feeling worse than they did before because mm -hmm. there really is not a lot of hope in that. Um, in June of this year, 2017, you, you um, wrote on Facebook, uh, made a, a post of something on Facebook about this book, and I want to quote what you said. You said, Spencer Kimball deeply believed that we must earn exaltation, merit forgiveness, build up a credit balance, measure up, pay off debts, and pile up credits with God. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and these come directly from the books, and then you mm -hmm. listed 11 points. Uh, now, there's a lot more than this, but you listed 11 specific points of particular errors like these that were found in the book that he attributed to uh, a repentance process to receive forgiveness. So we want to discuss those 11 points plus some of the extra things that we both have on our hearts to talk about. Uh, so the approach I want to take is I'll list the point, I'll mention the point, and then you explain whatever you feel sure. like that you would like to put in that point. Except first, I want to ask you, is are there certain people, biblical characters, that the LDS do not believe, that the church itself does not believe, uh, that they were forgiven, like King David and Well, I'll give you four, four categories. And by the way, this is very helpful because we can talk about concepts of what in theory is required for achieving forgiveness, but it, it's helpful to complement that with particular specific people that Spencer Kimball at least believed uh, did not achieve forgiveness. Um, uh, we'll start with the woman caught in adultery. Uh, it's a beautiful story in John 8. Um, Spencer Kimball appeals to it and says, uh, quote, did the Lord forgive the woman? Could he forgive her? There seems to be no evidence of forgiveness. His command to her was, go and sin no more. He was directing the sinful woman to go away, abandon her evil life, commit no more sin, transform her life. So what's really odd about that is it, the way the story reads, it's neither do I condemn you. Je mm. Jesus says, who is here, you know, who's left to condemn right. you? And he says, he looks mm. at her and you can just feel, oh, right. Jesus, Jesus, the Lord of the universe, your creator, your shepherd um, looks at you and says, neither do I condemn you. Right. And Spencer Kimball says, well, he didn't necessarily forgive her. Uh, he must have missed that sentence, right? Well, for the Christian, it's like, yeah. And, and it, Kimball just wants to take the oomph out of it and, and, and make sure that you understand that she has it yet to complete a process that would lead to forgiveness. The second uh, category would be, the second group here, would be the thief on the cross. Yeah. Very, very specific person. There's, there's two thieves, but one of the thieves turns to Jesus and says, remember me. You know, when you go yeah. into your kingdom, remember me. And uh, Kimball says, another mistaken idea is that the thief on the cross was forgiven of his sins when, dying, when the dying Christ answered, today you shall be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. These men on the cross were thieves. How could the Lord forgive a malefactor? They had broken laws. There was no doubt of the guilt of the two men for the one voluntarily confessed their guilt. The Lord cannot save men in their sins, but only from their sins. And that only when they have shown true repentance. The one sh thief did show some compassion, whether selfishly with hope, we are not sure. It's kind of a cynical, it's kind yeah. of an ugly. Yeah. He was confessing, but how could he abandon his evil practices when dungeon walls made his deeds impossible, made evil deeds impossible? How could he restore the stolen goods when hanging on the cross? How could he, as John the Baptist required, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance? How could he live the Lord's commands, attend his meetings, pay his tithing, serve his fellow man? Exactly. All these take time. Exactly. Time was the one thing that he was running out of very rapidly. Uh, quote, no, he further quotes, no unclean thing can enter the kingdom of God 
Uh, the thief's show of repentance on the cross was all to his advantage, again, cynicism, but his few words did not nullify a life of sin. The world should know that since the Lord himself cannot save men in their sins, sins, no man on earth can administer any sacrament, which will do that impossible thing. Mm. I just, oh, I just, isn't that sad? Um, uh, well, the third category uh, totally is King missing, David. Co- totally missing God's grace. Totally oh. missing that Jesus was dying right there on the cross for that person he was forgiving. Yeah, and, and, and he promising. says a word just can't take away that. Yeah. But you think about Jesus. He stops Whoa. a storm with his words. He created by the word of his power. Exactly. Uh, he said it is finished on the cross. <laughs> uh-huh. Don't underestimate the words and the works of exactly. Jesus. Exactly, the word of God. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I monologue. The third category is King David. And this, uh, this one's a, a this one's like hitting a nerve with us Christians, really, because you know we love the story yeah. of King David being forgiven. But Kimball writes, um, for his dreadful crime, all his life afterwards he sought forgiveness. Some of the Psalms portray the anguish of his soul. Yet David is still pained for his sin. Oh the prophet Joseph Smith underlined the seriousness of the sin of murder for David as for all men, and the fact that there is no forgiveness for it. A murderer, for instance, one that sheds innocent blood, cannot have forgiveness. And he goes on to say, A life is gone and the restitution for it in full is impossible. Repentance in the ordinary sense seems futile. And he goes on to write, Occasionally, people who have murdered come to the church requesting baptism, having come to some partial realization of the enormity of their crime. Missionaries do not knowingly baptize such people. Oh, my and for for no us, there. for believers, it's it's just we're we're thinking, what are you talking about? But when Nathan confronted David over his sin very uh-huh. severely, um, Nathan tells David, "The Lord has, has done away with your right. sin." Right, exactly. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, just like yeah. with the with the woman who caught in adultery, it's very clear. And uh, we can come back to this, but. Na- Prophet Nathan does say there's going to be consequences that there's a third party that's going to suffer, mm-hmm. especially his son. David's mm-hmm. son is put to death. It, it, it dies. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there, there's a there's a substitutionary atonement, so to speak, that capital punishment was required for such a crime. Right. And there was a capital punishment right. uh, enacted, but it was uh, diverted from David onto his own son, uh, much like Abraham's. Uh, the, 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 the sacrificing of his son was diverted to the, the okay. animal that God supplied. This is all just screaming out hmm. what's going to come a millennium, millennium later with mm-hmm. Jesus on with the cross. Jesus, exactly. um, and then uh, the fulfillment. I, I, I get a little worked up about this, but uh, um, in Psalm 51, David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according mm-hmm. to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. And uh, he says, Cleanse me from my blood guilt. He, and he you know, and God. you know what? Psalm fifty-one is the classic forgive or repentance and forgiveness psalm for King David and yeah. and this Bathsheba affair. But just recently, I found from a Mormon site that they were introducing Psalm fifty-one as a good repentance uh, that that David used. In fact, they're they're using the Christian application to it now. This is odd to me um, because. I think about theater and about how God uses Old Testament people as illustrations or figures mm-hmm. that helpfully serve as theater illustration. You have Adam, exactly. his yes. sin, the fall, uh, it, 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 uh, it's the first sin and it's represented, uh, all of us humanity sins in Adam, so to speak. We all fall in Adam. Uh, Adam is our representative head. You have Israel itself. And Paul argues in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, that Israel's failure to be justified by the law illustrates, by, by way of analogy, the whole world's mm-hmm. inability to keep the law. Mm-hmm. And it shows that no one can be justified by works because the law just brings knowledge of sin. Right. And then a chapter later, in Romans chapter 4, Paul teaches that if you stop working for it and start trusting God who justifies the ungodly, yeah. he uh, counts you as godly. He counts you as righteous. He justifies you, even though you don't deserve it. And the net, this is verses four and five. What's cool is the verses six, verse six and seven and eight say, quote, uh, comma, just as David also speaks of the blessedness of the one uh, to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. And then he quotes Psalm 32, which says, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven and whose sins the Lord will not count against him. So 
Paul yeah. holds up David as an illustration of, of uh, alongside Abraham, David and Abraham, examples of people who were forgiven, ungodly people who were forgiven, counted righteous, right. freely as a gift. And so uh, it's... And, and if you yeah. can't, and, and, and that passage in Romans, if you can't admit that you're ungodly, you're not eligible for forgiveness because he, he justifies the ungodly. He yeah. doesn't justify the self-righteous yeah. person. Okay, well, that, that's great. And you, did, you, did you have another one? Or one more quickly. Uh, there are people who killed Jesus, the people mm. who were responsible conspiratorially and yeah. collectively, uh, e either willfully or just by passively contributing to the death of Christ. Um, there's a sermon in the book of Acts. I think Peter says, you killed the author of life. Yeah. And uh, it's super interesting. Joseph Smith, and this, this is what makes it uh, directly relevant to our, our polygamous friends who may not uh, acknowledge Kimball as a prophet, but do acknowledge Joseph Smith as a prophet. Mm -hmm. um, Spencer Kimball is appealing to Joseph Smith for his logic here. Uh, Spencer Kimball quoting Joseph Smith right. on Peter's sermon at the day of Pentecost regarding those who had killed Christ. Uh, Smith says, He did not say to them, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. But he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. This is the case with murderers. They could not be baptized for the remission of sins, for they had shed innocent blood. <laughs> so he, he makes this distinction, Joseph Smith, yes. that their sins were somehow blotted out, but not forgiven. But not forgiven. And uh, we, this is Peter's Pentecost uh -huh, sermon, uh -huh. where he's calling them to repentance for what other reason than to be forgiven? And, and exactly. It's, it's and, mind boggling. And, and, and on top of that, on the cross, Jesus yeah. said, Father, forgive yes. them, for they know. And there's yes. not any big long repentance process required point. at that point either. So that, wow, those are four powerful explanations. And I do know that uh, I've talked to people in the polygamy groups that they do not believe that David was forgiven. They do not believe that he could receive forgiveness for what happened with Uriah. Um, now, d going back to the post that you are talking about, that you introduced this information to, you quoted several pages um, of, of uh, what Kimball has written in his book, which always, every one of them leads to meriting repentance, meriting forgiveness, meriting, mm -hmm. of course, ultimate salvation. On page seven, you quoted two. Uh, the first one said, one cannot receive salary without having met satisfactorily the conditions of his employment. And the next one, one cannot expect a degree from any college without having paid his tuition and fees. Obviously, you're compar there. Uh, he's comparing eternal life mm -hmm. with what we do on earth, you know, the works yeah. balancing act that we do on earth to, to earn a paycheck, but it's not the same thing. Yeah, Kim Bolt thinks it's appropriate to reach for uh, metaphors that illustrate us qualifying or earning or meriting, uh, achieving something by our own uh, qualifications. He thinks those metaphors are appropriate for achieving eternal life mm -hmm. and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's really inappropriate because the very Bible much, goes out much. of its way to say, again, back to Romans chapter 4, there's an explicit counting metaphor. Verse 4, it says, when a man works, his yes. wages are not counted to him as a gift, but as his due. Mm -hmm. So if you're a pizza delivery uh, guy and you get your paycheck at the end of the two weeks, it's not a Christmas gift. Ho hopefully, there, if someone said, well, this is a gift, that'd be an insult. Oh, boy. Uh. No, this is owed to you. They're, right. they're indebted to you. And Paul says that's that's the case. And the next verse says, but to the one who does not work as though you can earn it, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, mm -hmm. his faith is counted mm -hmm. for righteousness. So then, it's just yeah. the opposing, exactly oh, yeah. the opposite of what Kimball was teaching. Absolutely. And then in Isaiah chapter 55, it says that God's ways are not our ways. Mm -hmm. His ways are higher than our ways. And so if he's trying to equate getting to heaven with the human ways, you, he's forgetting God's ways are greater. We have much ours. better metaphors available to us showing grace. <laughs> oh. uh, biblical metaphors like adoption, where you take someone who's dirty and unqualified uh -huh. and uh, a, a, an alien, a stranger, an enemy, and then you embrace them and adopt them and love them and include them mm -hmm. and accept them. And call them your own. And those, are the ones, those are the metaphors Paul and Peter use. That's awesome. It is awesome. Uh, the third one is from page 124 uh, where you said, if we measure up fully, we are guaranteed limitless blessings. And in that same uh, discussion on page 124, it says something I didn't know before, that those who are responsible to 
hold the priesthood will be damned and condemned if they don't do it. I never realized that before I read this in the book. Mm. But at any rate, limitless blessings are are um, to those who are measure up fully. Only to measure up fully. That's yeah. fu fully means completely, totally, yeah. with nothing lacking. Yeah, that's an inappropriate language for the gospel. Uh, Paul, Very much. We, we hear it over and over again that, um, I mean, Jesus himself talks about, uh, you know, if you're out um, working and you come back and, and there's a seems to be an unequal wage, uh, Jesus wants, he says, to have the attitude of a worker who says, you know, who doesn't complain about uh, getting something that, that was promised to you when someone else gets it for less work. The, the economy of grace, mm -hmm. the economy of mm -hmm. the kingdom of God and, and rewards it's it's not like the world. It's not like yes, capitalism. Exactly. Capital capitalism's great, but it's not a good analogy for uh, grace mm -hmm. at all. Um, in fact, the whole point of the gospel is that no one's measured up fully. In fact, it's not that we've slightly you know got missed the mark. It's that we're f it's not that we're good people and that we occasionally do bad things. It's that we have. Um, a, a, it's like we're the those big light poles when a hurricane comes. You ever see those pictures and they're just mm -hmm. bent? Yep. We're no. all those bent we're light. All... We're just we're, we're bent toward sin, mm -hmm. and we need someone to save us. Uh, in spite of our, I mean, it's not what we've measured up. It's that right. we've, we've we, de demerited. Well, and the salvation. thing is, we can't do better. We can't be better. We can't be perfect, because, and God will only let perfect people into heaven, so we have to get in there on Christ's perfections. Amen. Anyway. So th this is really cool because we, someone might say, well, uh, God doesn't require payment, or he doesn't require perfection at all. And a Christian would say, well, there's a yes and a no to that. <laughs> exactly. Um, am I saved by works? Yes, but not my own. Uh, and, am I perfect? Um, in Christ, yes. yes. Am I seen as perfectly qualified and comprehensively? But um, personal righteousness, not by, filthy rags. Uh, Paul says, not by works of righteousness that we have right, done. Right. Uh, we, uh, Paul says in Philippians, not having a righteousness of, of my, my own. own. Mm -hmm. This is an alien or asbestos, or this is a this is a the righteousness of another mm -hmm. counted to you. Uh, there's a beautiful passage it in is. Second. It, I apologize I, for ahead. monologuing no, so no, much. No, go ahead. Um, in Second Corinthians five twenty one. Uh, Paul says, uh, Christ became sin, which we, we should all go, whoa, what? Yeah. Uh, Christ became sin, uh, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. For us. For us, so that, he who, uh, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Yeah. So if you look at the, I invite the, the listener to look at the passage because yeah. Christ became sin in the same way we become the righteousness we have the righteousness so, of God so it's Christ. kind of an exchange yeah, yeah he takes our sin we take his righteousness it's a but I, only only yeah. happens by faith through his yeah. grace it's it's called Not the by works. the great exchange the double yeah. imputation all of Christ's righteousness is credited to me freely when i have a childlike faith with an imperfect incomplete but genuine repentance mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's a weak yeah. pitiful childlike repentance and with that seed of faith I look to Christ and I say, help. help. And he credits to me, in, he, he, like a daddy who hears a child going, dad, help. Yeah, and he, yeah. he just rushes in and he, he takes all of the sin that uh, you've committed, all the guilt and the shame, and he credits to Christ and all of the beautiful righteousness of Christ and all of that, all of his accomplishments. Um, all of the, I'd like to tell people, if you show up to God's temple, so to speak, and there's somebody at the front desk with a barcode scanner and they say, where's your temple recommend? You can look at to Jesus and say, he's my temple recommend. <laughs> Jesus is my temple clothing. He is Jesus, it, yeah. he's my mm -hmm. covering. He's, he, mm -hmm. he, uh, he earned a temple recommend on my behalf. Uh, anyway. and, and that's a very good analogy. I like that. Uh, he mentions on page 131 about the murderer. He says it cannot be forgiven, but he said a murderer can build up a credit balance in his favor. What's the credit balance? And it's too bad he didn't tell us how much that credit balance had to be. Yeah, the context of this is he's saying people who committed murder won't be exalted to the celestial kingdom. They won't be fully forgiven. But it's almost like saying you're going to spend time in this, uh, what shall we call it, a hellish heaven or heaven hell, heavenly hell, in a lesser kingdom that we call heaven that, that is hellish because you'll be supposedly 
in Mormonism, you have these three kingdoms. Right. That, you know this mm -hmm. that for the listener. Mm -hmm. These three heavenly kingdoms, they say, that uh, the first of which is where you spend with the Father and the Son. But those who have committed murder are, are uh, permanently disqualified from the top kingdom. And now they're going to be in these bo perhaps bottom two kingdoms of heaven. But then they go on to say, and it'll be like an eternal punishment there and a hellish experience because you'll be eternally regretful of not achieving something greater. And so as Kimball argues that people who have committed such murder should sort of uh, prepare for a, a, you know, it's kind of like going to prison and having like, uh, better accommodations, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, more money for the prison commissary, I guess. But uh, <laughs> if you're, if you're alienated, if you're, if you're separated from God, if you're separated from Christ, you shouldn't call heaven and you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't patronize us or, or right. come to talk to us right. about how we can earn uh, exactly. blessings. For exactly. This. Because the Bible tells us that being separated from God is eternal yeah. destruction. It yeah. is what perishing is in the Bible, separation from him. Um, and also they also teach on the other side of that, that um, even the lowest kingdom is better than life on earth. Well, where's the, where's the God's justification? Where one king, one kingdom. Yeah, yeah, exactly right, <laughs> exactly right. Um, we're, we're getting close, we only have a couple of minutes for this one, but uh, the next one is on page 211 and 12. It says, we must not fail to do the right things to earn our exaltation, and we take this in light of, just like you've done with the other scriptures from the Bible, totally in your face about, for by grace are you saved through faith, not by works. And yet he's saying we have to earn it. This is where all the BYU professors should squirm they and feel should. shame and embarrassment. Uh, they should stop pretending like uh, this was never taught. I, I remember I talking to a very prominent LDS professor uh, who was, used to be the dean of the religion department. And I asked him, well, have you ever done a, I was sort of a coy question. Have you done a review of the miracle of forgiveness? What are your thoughts on the miracle of forgiveness? And he goes, and he whispers to me in a crowd. And he, I, I've come to see repentance and forgiveness very different from, from oh. Spencer Kim, oh. Prophet Spencer, Spencer Kimball. And, and it's just this, you know, he'll publicly promote uh, certain ideas, but reserve any critiques for his leaders privately. Oh and this is important to me because LDS uh, authors right now are pretending like such things that we could earn our exaltation mm -hmm. had never been taught. Uh, they've been taught from the highest yeah. uh, levels. Oh, yeah. Okay, now we're, in, we're out of time now, but we're going to have part two on this, and we're going to come back and talk some more. And I want to talk some more about Ephesians 2, 8, 9, being saved by grace, and that Kimball calls it was a satanic teaching. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will be back. Thank you, Aaron. We'll be back for part two. You know, Jesus often said, uh, as we have discussed, your faith has saved you. He said, your faith has healed you. Yet he never met the paralyzed man before, yet he freely and quickly forgave him. And in for forgiven the sinful woman, he never warned her of a very long, drawn out process of repentance to receive forgiveness. First John chapter two tells us that our sins are forgiven on account of the name of Jesus, not on account of any miserable repentance process. Jesus is everything, so he is all we need in everything, including repentance and forgiveness. Thanks for watching.